Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee in 2022. I'd like all those uh, using uh, electronic devices uh, to, to switch them to silent, please. Uh, our first item of business today is to decide whether to take item four in private and whether to consider the consideration of a draft pre-budget letter uh, should be taken in private at our next meeting. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, our second item of business today is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands uh, as part of our pre-budget scrutiny. And I welcome to the meeting Marie Goujon, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands, George Burgess, the Director of Agriculture and Rural Economy, Alan Gibb, uh, Head of Sea Fisheries Marine Scotland. Uh, Join us remotely is Erica Clarkson, the Joint Interim Head of Division uh, from Rural and Islands uh, Futures, and she tell Mera, Head of Strategy and Engagement for Portfolio Budget and Spending Review. Uh, we've got about 90 minutes for questions this morning, uh, and I'll kick off. Um, can I ask whether the ambitions and the objectives of the National Island Plan are being sufficiently supported uh, by the Scottish Government's budget? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to start, Convener, by, I think, talking about just the significant situation that we find ourselves in in relation to the budget and I know that the finance secretary will be bringing forward the emergency uh, budget in due course uh, and the significant constraints that we're working under as well so this is a really difficult and challenging time both for my portfolio as well as uh, across government too but in relation to your question about delivering against the objectives of the national islands plan I believe that uh, both within my portfolio and across government, we are doing that as, uh, as best we possibly can. We obviously have the 13 strategic objectives. We have over 100 commitments in relation to delivering those objectives. But I think both from the spend within my own portfolio, we have the island-specific funding uh, as part of that. But there's also the spend from right across other government departments as well, whether that's in relation to rural housing within Shona Robison's portfolio, when we look at the commitment to the island's growth deal and the £50 million pounds that's been committed there, uh, as well as uh, other funding streams too. I, I think that we are doing as best we can to deliver against those strategic objectives that are within the National Islands Plan. Um, just, just on that, we, we heard from uh, local authorities uh, last week, and there were some concerns over the, the, um, the competitive nature of, of funding. What, what's your views on the difficulties, given the resource issues that some local authorities have in, in, in actually getting the funding they require? It was really interesting to go through the evidence that the committee had heard last week as well, because I know obviously we ran the competitive model for the funding this year, but we'd also run the direct allocations process the year before. So it's important for us to, to hear that feedback and to see and find out how local authorities found that process. I do think, like anything, there's pros and cons to either approach, and I, it, I think all of that is learning that we can take forward as we're looking to develop future years of the islands programme as well. And I know that some local authorities would probably have received less than what they would have received through the direct allocations process, whereas other local authorities will have received more through the, the competitive process as well. And we're able to, uh, to receive quite a significant um, chunk of funding through that. I, well, when you look at Orkney Islands Council, for example, the 1.5 million that was allocated there, uh, which, would have, which was over and above what they would have received through a direct allocation model. So I think it's really important for us to listen to that feedback uh, to determine how we, how we take this future and forward. In relation to why we decided to go with the model uh, and the competitive funding model for this current year, it was based on... A, well, trying to ensure that we were delivering the funding as effectively and efficiently as we could within the timescales that were available. I know that from the evidence the committee heard, there were concerns around that, around well, the fact that there were the local government elections. But of course, we also want to ensure that there are enough time to develop bids and that these bids are going to be successful and deliverable within the timescales that we are working to. So it was also built on a model of the, the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund as well, which I, local authorities are familiar with. So that's why we adopted that model, but again, I think it's really important we take that learning uh, into future years. Yeah, in, in future years, what, what do you uh, see the changes that will come about to the, to the policies you have about delivering funding? 
I think it, is, it really is just a case of, of taking that learning. As I say, there are pros and cons to, to either of those approaches that we've taken. Um, but I think it's really important as well that we work with the local authorities on the projects that hadn't been successful this time round. I think we'd had 15 applications to the fund, 11 of which were successful, uh, so that we can see what work can be done to ensure that we can continue to take these important projects forward. And, and that's where the work with the Scottish Futures Trust has been really important as well, I think, in working with local authorities uh, and their experience in going through, the, through this process. So I think having their expertise and advice, which I, I, I think hopefully the committee picked up from the session last week as well, which I, I, I do think our local authority partners find very helpful, uh, we can take that learning going forward. But I think I, I do obviously want to ensure that we are doing a full evaluation of the scheme for the past year in comparison to the previous year as well uh, to determine how we take that forward in future years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alistair Allen. Thank you, Convener. Um, you've alluded there to some of the budgetary pressures that the Scottish Government is currently facing. Obviously, um, we, we know about the impact of uh, inflation on the budget in real terms, 5.2 per cent reduction, I understand. So what were the first of the challenges and what were the what was the rationale that you used within your own budget in terms of coping with and prioritising in the face of that situation? Absolutely. I mean, we can't underestimate the scale of the challenge that's been presented to my portfolio and other, uh, and right across the, the Scottish Government. So the inflationary pressures that you're talking about there, uh, we, we've seen since the UK Government spending review uh, in December last year, uh, a £1.7 shortfall when you take, that, uh, take all those inflationary pressures into account. That was at a time when I think inflation was sitting at about 3%. Uh, and obviously look at the rates that, that we're experiencing now. So it has been particularly challenging, but I think certainly within my own portfolio is trying to ensure that we're giving as much stability and clarity uh, to people as we can, I think, uh, and trying to, to protect our, uh, uh, as we were talking about the work that's been delivered through the Islands programme, ensuring that we are continuing to deliver on that, uh, to deliver across the strategic objectives. Um, and of course, uh, trying to, uh, when we look at the overall government objectives too, we've got, serious, we've got to try and tackle poverty, we've got to try and help people through this cost of living crisis and I know the, the Deputy First Minister will be making more announcements on that through the emergency budget review too and my priority within that has been obviously to look out for the, the, the communities in our, our, our rural and island uh, right across our rural and island, island areas and uh, to ensure that when it comes to particularly the agriculture side as well that we've been continuing to, to do what we can to ensure that there's that cash flow there because we know that that has been a huge concern of the industry and I think just as an example of that um, there were calls to bring forward the payments which we did this year to their earliest ever level. We've since made payments to over 14,000 businesses and paid out over three, uh, nearly £330 million so we've tried to do what we can within the parameters that we have to try and ease the cash flow worries uh, where they exist and to deliver on the priorities for our, our rural and island community. So, if I may, does the, does the government in that case um, have its own source of information about the kind of uh, inflationary pressures that exist for, for rural businesses, agricultural businesses? And how has that been, you've alluded to it there, but uh, how has that shaped or, or determined what you've done in, your, in the budget and the portfolio? Uh, well, I think particularly when we look at agriculture as an example of that and the, the term agflation, which is used there, just the tremendous increase in input co costs right across the bit, whether that's feed, fuel and fertiliser. So for some of these areas, of course, it's, it's not possible for us to make meaningful interventions because the main levers rest with the UK government. And that's where we've tried to do what we can, both within the portfolio and across Scottish government, to mitigate these pressures where we can. But I, again, without the full powers... Uh, and able to do that, it's not possible to take that meaningful action where we know it's needed. I mean, we do obviously welcome the, the package that's been introduced by the UK government, but uh, unfortunately it's only for six months in relation to the energy reliefs, uh, with, uh, and we don't know what's going to happen beyond that time. So I think that'll be of, of little comfort to those that are really struggling at the moment. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Jim Fairley. Yeah, you've, thanks much, Kim. You've kind of answered so much of the questions that I was going to ask there, um, Cabinet Secretary. The, the £1.7 billion uh, inflationary de deduction or loss of funding that the, the Scottish Government are, are dealing with, um, I was going to ask you how that's going to affect your overall budget. 
because um, I know from farming businesses, despite the fact that the £300 million has been delivered earlier than possible to help with that cash flow, um, how do you see farm budgets, your budget being affected by that £1.7 billion reduction in the Scottish Government's funding? Uh, well, you'll have seen the impact from the, the figures that have been published and in the statement that the Deputy First Minister had provided to Parliament as well. And it's been incumbent on all of us to identify the savings that are possible within our portfolio so that we can help with the cost of living crisis uh, across government too. Uh, we know that one of the key issues for uh, the agriculture sector was about that cash flow, as I, I said in my response to Alistair Allen there, which is why we listened and did what we could to try and bring forward the payments to as early possible a date as we could. And I think that that cash flow should help provide um, some, uh, some security to the industry at the moment. But of course, these pressures haven't gone away. Uh, I talked about the, the prices of, uh, well, all input costs have risen right across the piece. And we know that people are struggling. So that's where we've done what we can within the powers that we have. To, to try and ease with some of those issues. But again, I think we need to, to see that action at a UK government level as well in relation to the, the meaningful interventions that can be made. Yeah, OK. There are going to be serious problems in the coming year with fertiliser costs, feed costs, fuel costs. These things are going to put enormous pressure on agriculture. And I get that we've got that right across the country. Um, but I am genuinely concerned about where that's going to lead us going forward. And that's more a statement than a question. Can you know? uh, thank you. Um, uh, given that the, the island's plan funding, which was announced last uh, year, dedicated 13, 30 million to be spent over five years, why, why has the government decided to distribute it in uh, single year rounds? Um, and you know, we, we also heard that the council said that the island programme funding hasn't been sufficient to deliver the ambitions of the, the plan. Uh, can you also um, give us your, your opinion on whether, uh, you know? a multi-year approach would be more appropriate? I, to be honest, I, I would actually agree with that, but unfortunately we're not in a position where we can, where we can do that um, because we don't have that certainty of funding for, for future years and it's, it's just simply not possible for delivering that timescale. So I think I'm really sympathetic to those, those arguments and I think ideally we would be running multi-year rounds, but unfortunately, as I say, it's, it's just not possible because we get yearly allocations uh, and the yearly allocations from the UK government. And it's obviously different to when we were members of the EU where we had that seven-year clarity of funding and it was possible for us to be able to, to plan in relation to that as well. Uh, so that does make things, I, I know that it is a, a difficult for local authorities in relation to that, um, but it's, uh, it's just not possible for us to, to consider that at the moment. Okay. Um, we, we heard that uh, previously the budget was supposed to be £30 million. Um, but in the spending review, that was reduced to, to 25.8 million. So that's a reduction of, of 4.2 million. Um, how do you then budget uh, to provide uh, extra funding to, to, to look at contracts that have already been given, so an increased fuel charges or construction charges? Uh, and we heard that there, there was extra budget available for that. So how much money have you set aside to, to assist in the, the tendering process where contracts uh, for example, fuel costs. I know Forest and Land Scotland are reviewing some of the contracts they've got and, and they're providing extra budget to cover that. Is there any uh, allocation of budget uh, that you're considering putting aside to ensure that these uh, projects go ahead given the, the rise in costs? Yes, that's built into the programme. I'm sure uh, Erica will correct me if I'm wrong on the figures in relation to that, but I believe that within the island's programme for this year, there was nearly £200,000 which had been set aside for contingencies. I see Erica nodding her head, so I I'm glad my figures aren't off on that. But we do build that in, I think, recognising the, the difficulties that you've alluded to there. OK. Jim Fairley. Thanks so much, Kevin. I'm going to come back to the, the, the multi-year um, budgeting. When you say that you... Do you only get, all you get allocated on a year-on-year -year basis? Is that why you cannot give multi-year funding to local authorities? Yes, that's why it's not possible for us to do that. And I think we get indicative allocations. And I, I think one point I would want to make clear as well, that what we see through the capital spending review and the resource spending review aren't budgets. Though, you know, there be... Those, are, those figures are brought forward based on a number of assumptions, and we still go through the normal uh, annual budget cycles. But I would also emphasise as well that we don't have any clarity on funding beyond 2025, so it's not possible for us 
um, to plan in detail beyond that point because we don't know what our allocations are going to be. So what we've set out in the capital spending review and the resource spending review are the overall funding envelopes, but it's not the, we're still to work through the detail of that once we know what the, what the actual allegations are going yeah, to be. So these fundings are, in, or these allocations are indicative rather than set in stone. So they could yeah. be changed at the last minute so that you then have to make adjustments. I would like to be an optimist. Maybe, hopefully, the figures may uh, improve over uh, in coming years. So, uh, uh, from the way things are heading, I don't think that will be the case. But, um, yes, they're in indicative. They're the overall funding envelopes we believe we may have, and we work on that basis. But uh, the committee will no doubt be aware from the budget process we went through last year as well, uh, that we st that we're to go through the detail of that and bring forward the budget and our proposals for that in the normal fashion um, in relation to the, the, uh, the legislation that's brought forward. It does make it very difficult for anybody to try to look at a long-term project, doesn't it? It absolutely does, um, and I would agree with that as well. And I think that that comes through in the, the evidence and the feedback that we hear. And I think especially it, it can be really difficult, and I appreciate the difficulties that are there for either businesses who apply to some of our grant funding rounds and the tight time scales that are there to turn that around. And I talked earlier about the model that we adopted for the Islands programme and why we adopted that model to try and ensure that we were um, uh, delivering, uh, that projects were deliverable within the time scales that we had. So I, I am absolutely sympathetic to that, but unfortunately we're in the position where it's not possible for us to, to open up those multi-year rounds because we don't have the the clarity and the, of the, the seven-year funding rounds which we previously had as members of the EU. Okay, I won't labour the point. Thanks, Convener. Uh, Ariane Burgess. Thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so last week we heard from the three councils that gave, local authorities that gave evidence that based on their first experience of the, with, with, with the competitive bidding process that it didn't best support communities. I just wondered what your thoughts are on the competitive bidding approach and um, do you think it achieves the right balance of funding national priorities whilst also supporting local decision making? I, I think it does strike that balance and I think that was another benefit of having the, the competitive model because it's being able to ensure that we're aligning it, the national priorities with, uh, with what the needs of our, our communities on the ground as well. And I think I, I talked about in response to the first question, I think just one of those projects which we funded in Orkney, which was uh, building a, a nursery there, which was, I think you heard about that in your evidence as well, about the impact that that has in terms of, you know, retaining the population in Orkney as well and just how critical a need that was. So I think it does have benefits in relation to that and I think the work that SFT did as well, working with local authorities and having their expertise has been really helpful throughout that process as well. And like I say, it was, it was modelled on the regeneration capital grant fund schemes because that is a model which is more familiar to, to local authorities in terms of the, the whole process. So again, I think it's, it's one of these things that, you know, there are pros and cons on either side in relation to that or the direct allocation model as well. Um, but I, I, I would like to think, and I do think from some of the projects that were successful in those rounds that it has delivered both on the national priorities, but as well as what our, our communities and, island, uh, and islands need. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Jenny Minto. Thanks, Convener, and thanks, panel, for coming um, today. Uh, as Ariane Burgess um, talked about uh, the, the competitive process and how that may have or may not have worked um, for some of the, the councils involved, um, we got really clear information from, I think, the, the Scottish Futures Trust about the relationships that had been built up between the, the councils and also the communities. So I just be interested to hear if you've got any thoughts on that. And there was also a bit of discussion about pipeline of projects, and you referenced earlier that projects that perhaps didn't um, pass this this round or weren't successful this round are still being looked at. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. 
Uh, yes, just to say that I wouldn't want anybody to think that the work that's been undertaken in relation to those projects has been wasted, and I don't underestimate for a moment, I think, just how much work goes into preparing these bids and, and putting that forward. And I, I know there were various issues around that that the committee heard about mm -hmm. last week too. So I think that's, I, I, again, one of the, uh, the key things from this process in working with SFT is ensuring that there is that, that ongoing dialogue to see, well, if the bids weren't successful this time, how can we get them into a situation where they, they could potentially be successful mm -hmm. for, uh, for either future rounds of the programme um, uh, and what we're looking to, to deliver. So I think that that ongoing work and continuing that dialogue is, is really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. There was one point raised by my, my own councillor, Guy and Butte, about the, the separation taking it away from island communities, and maybe that wasn't in the spirit of the, the Islands Act. I'd just be interested to hear your, your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, and that's where we have trialled, a, a, and there have been different approaches that we've taken to other funds that we've run as well. So for the Islands programme previously, we had that as three separate strands allocated in a number of different <coughs> ways. And uh, again, it's really important that we take the learning from that. And that, uh, I know that there are other funds that are directly available for communities to bid straight into. Um, I think it depends on the fund and the, the objectives of those, uh, of those funds that we do as well. There are others that, uh, like what we've just done, where the local authority are the, are the lead partner in relation to that. So I, I do think it's important sometimes to, to have that mix. We certainly don't want to cut people out of the process. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that the projects that are coming forward are what genuinely what communities need. I don't think it's for us to, to dictate to communities that uh, the certain infrastructure that they need uh, across all our, our island communities. They're all unique and different in their own ways and face different, some similar challenges, some different challenges. So I think it's really important that the projects that are brought forward are organic in that sense and, and come from communities. So I, I think it's, so it is important, I think, to, to, to have that mix, but also you know, I'm, I, I really value the feedback that we get and the, the learning that we've taken from the previous rounds of the programme as well to ensure that when we are bringing forward future years of funding, we're delivering in, it in a way uh, that, that works most importantly for our island communities. So um, it's, it's not set in stone because I think the evidence that the committee took was really important. It's important for me to, to hear that and to, and to see that and exactly how they found that process so that we take that learning into future years. Great. Thank you. Beatrice Wishart. Thanks, convener. Good morning. Um, just going back to the competitive bidding approach, um, and obviously some island local authorities will have more expertise and capacity to bid for funding than others. So how, does, how do you ensure a level playing field? Uh, yes, that was a, a, a point that I, I took away from the committee session last week as well. And I understand the, the pressures that, that local authorities are under in, in relation to that. And I think also hearing about the, the different funds that are out there too and uh, just how that can be a challenge in and of itself. But I think that's where the working with the Scottish Futures Trust has been helpful in that regard too. And I think that's also why we wanted to, to work with them in relation to this round of the funding because of the experience, the expertise that they have in delivering infrastructure, but also in working with partners too. So it was really good to hear that feedback last week about the, and hearing from some of them about the the advice and the help that the, and assistance that they'd been able to get from SFT. So I think that was that was really uh, important as well. Um, but of course, we are happy to work with local authorities as well when it comes to that that capacity issue, recognising the challenges that can exist there. But again, I would come back to the point that about the, the model and why we'd selected that as well and looking at the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund because we wanted to ensure that it wasn't going to be a process that would be completely alien or overly burdensome to, to local authorities, uh, which is why we decided to, to model it on that approach as well, to hopefully make that a bit easier. But again, um, I, I, I recognise those challenges that were picked up last week, and, uh, and that's where that feedback is really important. Thank you. Officer Allen. Um, thank you. Um, on the back of that, um, I suppose not only do different local authorities have different um, resources available to them, but different communities, different islands, individual islands within those authorities have, have different opportunities to, to make their voice heard. So I just wonder how you, you manage to hear the diversity of islands within local authorities. 
Uh, absolutely. Well, first of all, I would say that even within our islands, Stephen, I think that's a, a point I've made to, or uh, the directors made to the committee previously. You know, our islands team are you know, predominantly based on islands as well and live within the communities, um, and are, are tuned into getting that feedback. And in relation to the the panel that we had um, for the islands programme as well, I think everybody within that has had experience of either living in or, or working in islands as well, which is really important. Uh, it is vital that we try and do what we can to hear the, the different voices that are out there. I mean, if the committee have any different suggestions as to how we might better do that, or if that's not adequately being done, then more than happy to, again, take that feedback and that, and that learning from it. But that is certainly uh, it is a really good point and, and I would come back to the point that I made in uh, Jenny Minto's question, in response to Jenny Minto's questions as well, that you know we want the projects delivered through this to, to have an impact on communities, to grow organically uh, from that as well, and work alongside them in the delivery of that. So I, I do hope that we're at least getting some of that right. But again, more than happy to, to hear from the committee on that one. Thank you. Just just to, to look at that a little bit more, we, we heard repeatedly about the cluttered and the exceedingly complex nature of funding particularly uh, uh, around uh, funding for islands. So what, what uh, interventions have you made to ensure the forthcoming budget um, deals with that uh, being cluttered and, and whatever? What, what, what are you going to do to, to solve that? And it's particularly important given the resource issues that we see local authorities experiencing at the moment. Yeah, no, and I'm really sympathetic to those points that had been raised by local authorities last week and recognise how, challenge, uh, how challenging that can be. And I think certainly within my, my own portfolio, we will ultimately aim to try and make the, the processes for uh, the different funding streams, uh, well, to ensure that they're as clear as possible and um, uh, are not too cumbersome on local authorities either. Or, uh, you know, and as we've already said through, this, through the Islands programme this time, ensuring that we're there to either help work with them or ensure that there's the capacity there to do that through working with partners such as such as SFT as well. Uh, but again, I'm more than happy to take that feedback. But again, sometimes this is out with our control altogether. So I think a couple of examples of that are the UK Government Leveling Up Fund, which I think, particularly for the Islands Programme, cut across it at the point when um, applications were, were coming forward. Um, and then we've also seen that, for example, in the marine space as well and the £100 million of, of funding, um, even though it's a devolved area, but where the UK government has made that, that direct spend. Um, without that... Funding, though. Oh, of course, any extra funding that we get is to be welcomed, but I think not when it's done without any consultation with the devolved administrations within, whom, within whose responsibility those policy areas lie. Because if it had been given to the devolved administrations, we can align it with our priorities rather than having conflicting processes, conflicting priorities, which does clutter that landscape and make it even more difficult for people to apply to these funds. Yeah, but we've got to remember that Scotland has two governments and, and they've both got priorities, I, th I think. Uh, yes, but we have specific powers and it should be within the Scottish Government's power. We should be given that funding to allocate in line with our policy priorities. OK. Alistair Allen. Thank you, Convener. I'm tempted to say that Scotland has two governments, but only one of them is elected. So can I ask, uh, how does that impact uh, on the work of the Scottish Government having money is spent on, on these priorities, which until now has always been regarded as devolved money? Um, I, well, it, it adds to that cluttered landscape. I think it cuts across some of the objectives that we would like to achieve. And I think the prioritisation can be completely different between the different pots of funding. And I think when you look to the, the Highlands and Islands, which was, when we were members of the EU, was a, a high priority area in relation to funding because of the remote and rural nature and the, the very specific challenges that our, our rural communities face, uh, where that was a high priority within the EU, it's certainly not as high a priority when it comes to, when you look at the, the spending through the uh, through the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, where the allocations fall far short of what we should have received and what we would have received were we still members of the EU. So, and at, at the end of the day, like I say, when it comes to fisheries, uh, that area is devolved, and if there's money to be there, it should be given to the Scottish Government to distribute in line with our own funding priorities. Thank you, Convener. Jenny Minto. Hey, Jim, here. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Um, given the, the, the fact that you've got um, levelling up funds coming into uh, areas where you are then having to work around them, have you made represent representation to the UK government to say that that money should become directly to you so that you can then deliver it to the priorities that the Scottish Government have set out in these devolved areas? Uh, yes, I have. I have made regular representations to my counterparts in the UK Government, as have other ministers. I, I think it is the business minister who has been um, uh, dealing with that in relation to the shared prosperity funding as well. So we do regularly make these representations. So, convener, in that case, can I ask, can we have the UK Government Minister for Agriculture come to this committee to ask her, answer the questions as to why the Scottish Government have been bypassed? I, I think the job of this committee is to scrutinise uh, and hold the Scottish Government to account. I think that is our Government, role. Absolutely. And the Scottish Thanks. Government are being held to account. The Cabinet Secretary has been here on numerous occasions. I think the UK Government, if they are bypassing the Scottish Government, surely is within our remit to ask questions of why the UK Government are making it more difficult for the Scottish Government. I think, I think uh, Mr Fairley, you will recognise that we did have the, the Secretary of State for rural affairs and agriculture at a previous meeting and there's an intention to have it in a future meeting. So I yeah. think that's already decided. And we, we do have, uh, yes, we had him here before, but I've got a new Minister yeah. for Rural Affairs in Westminster. There's a whole new budget. They have ca uh, crashed the Elms uh, decisions going on. Mr Fairley, this, this meeting's to, to look at pre-budget scrutiny the budget by the, Scot of the Scottish, Scottish Government. government. And there are direct we can, we can discuss this another time. Uh, Jenny Minto. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. I, I might say, though, that you, you did raise the fact that Scotland has got two governments, yeah. um, so I think we, we are quite reasonable to, to request this. Um, as you'll know, as I travel around Argyle and Butte, I get a lot of feedback from constituents, specifically on islands, um, saying that they really understand what their, um, what their island needs and their community needs. Um, so I'm just wondering, looking towards the future and the allocation of money um, in the future, um, whatever that may be, um, how, how you're going to learn from um, the responses that we've had with regards to this funding and then also vis-a-vis -vis allocations and learning more deeply from the communities that would argue they know best. Well, absolutely. And I think it's really important to see um, and, and get that feedback on exactly how, what those projects have delivered, you know, have they delivered on the objectives that we would hope to see? But you know, they go through a rigorous assessment process anyway. Hopefully, that, that they will uh, achieve that. But I think it's really important that we get that feedback. And as I was saying earlier, we've had uh, two years of funding where we've used the different allocation methods. So I think it's really important that we now take stock of that, take stock of the evidence that the committee has received and heard in relation to how those funds have operated and what they've delivered and particularly any feedback, I think, even individually that you're receiving from your own constituencies and uh, the people that live in the communities uh, about what that's delivering as well. I'm always open to, to hear that and to see what learning we can take for the future. Great. I will take you up on that offer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Adam. Apologies, convener. What number question is that? Uh, I thought it was the a final one in this features. section. Nine. Nine. OK, thank you. Um, good morning and hi to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to ask, um, in, the, in terms of the economic landscape that we're in at the moment, and I know this has been discussed previously um, by my colleagues, um, when it comes to the, the island's bond policy, what was the, what was the main reason for um, not going ahead with that? Essentially, that we'd listened to the people that live on our islands, and I, I think it was clear from that. Is when we'd gone out to consultation, we'd had extensive consultation, and the islands team had been out and engaging with different island communities as well. And even though I think the overall results to the consultation were well, it was finally almost balanced in terms of the uh, how people felt about it. I think it, you know, resoundingly came out from island communities that this wasn't a policy that they that they wanted to go ahead. And so, to be honest, quite simply, we, we listened to that. And I don't think, you know, I don't want to sit here and thrust uh, anything on islands and island communities that that they wouldn't want or a policy that that wouldn't end up working. Um, but 
I do think, though, that even though we are not going ahead with that policy, the consultation events that took place were really helpful, and okay. um, it was really important that we had undertaken those events, because there was so much that came out of that engagement that we are looking at now, and would hopefully be in a place to, to try and, and take forward. Like some, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the people that live in these communities know them best, and ha there was all sorts of different suggestions that came out of that as to what can help us really r retain populations in island areas. Um, so I think that that's where we're really focused on that feedback to see what learning we can take and if there are any potential other pilot projects that we can take forward as a result of that feedback. That's great to know. Can I just come back in on that, Camilla? Thank you. Um, the discussions that we had at committee last week, there, there was a lot of focus more on getting that, um, the voices of the people living there and that lived experience, you know, uh, grassroots, um, um, being a part of that conversation and um, the, the actions that are going to come from that. Has, have you seen a shift and a change in what people are desiring and wanting for the island communities because of the huge economic shift that's happening at the moment? Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, I know that it's our island communities and our rural uh, areas that are suffering the most as, as a result of the cost of living crisis. I think that just by their very nature, whether it's fuel costs, also the fact that so many people are dependent on on oil for heating and unregulated fuels, um, where I think you know, the capping of energy prices uh, doesn't really do much to, to help in, in some of these areas. So there are, I think, particular issues and challenges that a lot of our rural and island communities uh, face. That we, uh, that we are listening to and we're trying to get to grips with as well. I would also highlight that when it comes to the National Islands Plan, we have an island strategic group and we also have a National Islands Plan delivery group as well, where we try to, uh, well, we're engaging, first of all, in the implementation of the plan, but where we can pick up these, uh, any potential issues and ensuring that the objectives that we have set out, the commitments that we have there are still relevant. And it's really important that we hear that. And I would say that one change that we made in relation to the National Islands Plan delivery group, I'd want the uh, Young Islanders Network over the summer in Orkney and inviting that representation from young people on the delivery group as well, which I think is, is really critical going forward, um, so that we're getting that input and also as wide a representative input uh, as we can as well. So uh, it's really important for me to hear that. And as I say, our, our islands team officials are based on islands as well, um, to, because we, we need to hear that and hear what are the priorities for, for people living in our islands and rural areas. That's good. Thank you. It's especially pleased to hear about the young voices being involved. Yes. Very important. Thank you. Uh, we, we heard that, there, that there's already a, a 4.2 million reduction in the, the island's budget. Um, but there's also the 5 million that was originally committed to the, the island's bond policy. What, what are your plans to repurpose that? Um, as I say, well, there was some of that budget had been allocated to this year, so again, that's where we're taking the learnings that we heard from the Islands Bond consultation and engagement to see how we can progress with that as well. Uh, but obviously, future budget decisions, uh, again, will be working through that process, and no doubt the, the committee will be interrogating that in, in some more detail as well. But I would say that overall in the capital spending review, that um, where there is that reduction, I think it's important to remember that I mean, our, the, the capital allocation that we've had have been significantly constrained. So um, we received £175 million less than we'd anticipated throughout the, the UK government spending review towards the, the tail end of last year. And the capital allocations that we're getting are flat and they're falling over the course of the next few years. So of course we have to try and prioritise as best we can within that. But I would say in relation to the, the islands programme and the, the islands plan in particular, we have also allocated resource funding there as well. And I think it's important not to forget that, we have allocated an additional £10 million worth of resource, which is uh, delivering on various different projects. Like We have uh, we've appointed six uh, heritage and culture officers uh, across the, the different areas and across our islands. We also have um, innovation officer posts that we have appointed within uh, UHI, just as a couple of examples of how we are utilising that money. So we are trying to utilise the available funds we do have to deliver for our island community. But the, the five million is just going to go back into the pot. Uh, well, again, there would only have been a small allocation of that f within this financial year for spend. Um, but of course, we have to see what the allocations are going to be for forthcoming financial years before we take any further decisions. Okay, thanks, uh, Jim Fairley. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, 
The Deputy First Minister uh, wrote a letter to the Finance and Public Administration Committee uh, outlining that there's going to be um, potential budget savings. Where do you see those budget savings being made within the scope of this committee? <coughs> The overall budget savings that had been outlined from my portfolio, uh, I think, total about £61.5 million. Pounds. And again, to reiterate that this is such a, a, I can't just enforce enough to the committee just how challenging a, a position that we find ourselves in, in my portfolio and across government as well, in trying to tackle with some of the challenges that we're facing at the moment. But largely, what the, the savings that have been put forward within my own portfolio, I, the vast majority of that was ring-fenced funding, which means that while it's been offered as a saving, that ultimately has to come back to the portfolio because it cannot be spent in, in other ways. So, um, and it is just to make that point uh, clear to the committee as well. Some of the other savings that have been put forward were in relation to reforecasts of, of some of the demand-led schemes that we have as well and uh, controls on recruitment. So we've still tried to deliver on our priorities as best we possibly can, while recognising the significant challenges that we face. Um, so I hope that gives a, a broad outline of, of the, the savings that have been put forward. Yeah. Um, and going back to the convener's point, you're, he was asking if that £5 million will be going back to the central pot. Uh, are, do you still have it within your, the gift of your portfolio to be able to make interventions to help people with the cost of living crisis out with your normal funding? Will that come from central government? Well, again, I think that's where it's probably highlight. I think I alluded to that in some of my previous responses to, I think, the first initial questions as well, that we can't just look at my portfolio spend in isolation because it is about the, the wider work that's happening across government to help with the, the cost of living crisis. So those interventions, whether that's in relation to, to um, it can be discretionary housing payments, what we're doing in relation to fuel poverty, um, those budgets will be coming from different portfolios, but they will still have an impact right across rural Scotland and in our island communities as well. Okay. So we're really trying to deliver these interventions interventions uh, as best we can. So if, if the government is going to deliver interventions via different channels, but you're also saying that the funding for agriculture or for rural affairs is ring-fenced, that will come back to the rural economy at a later date, is that what you're saying? Yes, that, that's right. It will come back to the portfolio. Perfect. Thanks, Kim. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. That's exactly what I was just going to ask, Cabinet Secretary, um, regarding the the ring fence funding, which is 33 million, when will that come back and will it be allocated to the same ring fence spending that had orig originally been promised? And within regards to the 20, uh, sorry, the 61.3 million um, in terms of the cuts uh, that we will see um, due to the, some of the um, spending cuts, um, how do you think with regards to the the promises that you have given farmers in terms of you know ensuring that they they meet their demands in, in net zero and others capital particularly capital funding um, how, how is that going to kind of how are you going to look at that in the round sorry I'm not feeling that well so I'm I'm, I'm struggling to get this uh, <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, no problem. I think just touching on your first point, and, and just to clarify, yes, it will come back to the portfolio. Uh, as to when and how that happens, I'll be having those discussions with the, with the Deputy First Minister in relation to that. Um, but it, it will have to be spent within the, the ring fence purpose and on that, uh, uh, and within the portfolio area. Like I say, it's ring fence funding. It can't be spent in, in any other area, and it has to be returned to the portfolio. And that's the 33 million pounds worth of, of savings that had been identified there. In relation to the capital, as I was saying, the, the capital allocations that we've been given are flat and falling, and the funding that we would be expecting to receive in future years is coming through just as resource and not as capital. So we do know that we have particular issues in that regard. But in saying that, I know how vital that capital spend is. I think the first round that we had of the Sustainable Agricultural um, Capital Grant Scheme um, was very successful in what it achieved. We were facing 
really constrained budgets um, the, over this past financial year, which is why we've had to really target that, that funding specifically and why we'd focused on, um, on slurry in particular, I think, given the new regulations that had been brought forward. And we'd allocated the full £5 million of the Agricultural Transformation Fund uh, into that as well. And I think another point that I would just want to emphasise, though, is that the, the savings that have been um, put forward do not impact on any current spend that we have at the moment and they do not impact on the national test programme. We have committed to that £51 million of funding over the, the course of this year and the next two years, and we are still committed to that and, and maintaining those levels of funding. Thanks. Uh, can you explain why there was a drop from £45 million, uh, in the Agricultural Transformation Fund in 2021-22 down to just five in 22-23? Yes, there were a number of factors for that, and I think we actually discussed some of that when I came from my first budget appearance to the committee as well. I think around £20 million worth of funding within that was financial transactions and loans. I, now, we had not been able to use financial transactions. I'm sure Sheetal will, will, will keep me right in relation to that and thinking back to it. Um, but because we have to offer, if the government is to offer loans, we need to do that on a, a commercial basis. And it just simply it was isn't possible to spend that funding. I can't draw down allocations that I'm not able to spend, so that's why in relation to that. And I've also outlined the significant constraints that we face in relation to capital, which is why we decided to that I, I know that it was a cause of, of great concern into industry as well to see the uh, the capital budget available for agricultural transformation be lower than it had been in, in previous years. But there were all sorts of issues tied into that as well. We know that there were huge delays <laughs> in terms of getting that equipment, huge backlogs in relation to that. You know, that's not anybody's fault, with not industries, not governments. Um, so we had to ensure that we were using the resource we do have as best we possibly could. Thank you. Uh, Beatrice Wishart. Thanks, Convener. Um, we touched earlier on the inflationary costs across um, the, some of the projects um, and how that will be impacted. But in, gem in general terms, uh, with businesses in fishing, farming and, and food processing, uh, across rural and island areas are obviously all facing significant cost increases. So, uh, how is the Scottish Government budget going to support these, those businesses trying to weather uh, those increases? Yeah, I absolutely recognise that. And I think that whenever I've been out and about on different visits, I mean, I don't think there's one part either within my portfolio or right across the economy or society that's not struggling at the moment. I know that in rural and island areas that's felt particularly acutely because of some of the challenges we've outlined here. I think particularly the, the energy costs, we know the cost of living crisis is affecting everyone, but I think our rural communities uh, more so because of some of those factors. So we have tried to help with that as much as we possibly can. I talked about what we had been trying to do in relation to agricultural payments to at least ensure that there's that, that cash flow coming through to aid businesses uh, as best we possibly can. But we have also continued to deliver and, and develop some of our other schemes that I think will have that positive impact. We, so we had the Marine Fund Scotland, of course, this year and uh, over £14 million worth of funding available through that. We also have uh, the programmes like the Food Processing, Marketing and Cooperation Grant as well, which I believe that announcements are due to be made on that soon. We know how critical these, these projects are. I, I hear that all the time about what they've delivered in the past, so I think it's been really important that we've been able to, to continue on with these schemes and uh, try and ease the burden on businesses and communities as best we possibly can with the resources we have available. Thank you. Uh, Karen Adam. Thank you, convener. Um, in terms mostly of the fishing industry and the focus um, on them at the moment, it's, it really is a struggle for them, as you've highlighted. The, the cost of living crisis for them is mostly energy bills and the impact that that is having on them. In fact, um, just to quote, we had uh, Jimmy Buckin um, wrote to the um, well, he's a Scottish seafood industry boss, and he wrote to the chief exec of the Scottish Seafood Association, and he warned that the escalating fuel costs were having a devastating impact on our ability to remain viable. And he stressed how impactful this was, particularly on our food security. So that is really concerning. Um, you know, people across the board, individuals uh, and households are struggling. But when we look at the impact now upon our food security as well, it's really worrying. Is what can what can we do? What what has been done to help the the fishing sector? 
You're absolutely right, and I think that is, of course, a concern. And I think just to touch on the food security point for a moment as well, we obviously had the food security and supply task force and the recommendations from that, which we are in the process of, of, of implementing, doing what we can in that regard. Um, but also within that, we recognised that, of course, not all the levers to be able to affect that, as I was highlighting earlier, are within Scottish Government control, I think particularly when it comes to, to fuel and energy. Um, so, it, first of all, we make those representations continually to the UK Government to see what other interventions can be made there. But I do realise for some businesses that is particularly acute at the moment. And you're right, it does threaten our, our overall uh, food security and viability of some businesses if we're not able to offer them that support. We do also have a, a number of other forums in place. We have a Seafood Industry Action Group um, together with the UK Government where we meet with industry to try and address some of the challenges that we face. Because some of the challenges were uh, pre existing, the current situation that we're in, but they've only been exacerbated by everything that's happened yeah. since. We know that workforce still is a, a massive, massive issue. So again, it's trying to ensure that across the piece we're, we're taking action where we possibly can to help and assist with businesses. Can I, can I ask Cabinet Secretary, um, you know, as, uh, as the convener alluded to earlier, we, uh, you know, we are governed by, by two governments. And, and just as you spoke there, there is that reliance on them um, when it comes to particular policy and help and support and, and, and their duties in that regard. Is there any alignment there? Are you able to voice exactly what our fishing industry is needing here in the North East, for example, and they can come in and align with that? Or is, is, are you finding that difficult? I, yes, absolutely, because we do regularly raise these concerns, particularly when it's not in our... Uh, we just don't have the powers to deal with, with some of the most pressing issues. Um, we've done that through that action group. We have an interministerial group as well with the other devolved administrations in the UK government. I have a new counterpart as well where I've, I've raised a, a number of these ongoing issues. Um, and I think particularly what's important is the, are the recommendations that we had from the task force too. So there are some that we're in the process of delivering that are within our responsibility. Um, the establishment of a food security unit was one uh, in relation to that, uh, trying to corral some of our business support to make it easier for people to access. But there were a number of actions identified through the work of the task force that are the responsibility of the UK government that I, I've written to them about and to, to try and press where we can to, to get that meaningful action taken. Okay, thank you. Ariane Burgess. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. So, sticking with uh, fisheries uh, so, uh, and that kind of an enforcement piece. So, from what I understand, the fleet of the enforcement arm of Marine Scotland, Marine Scotland Compliance, is composed of just three vessels. And I'm also aware from uh, stakeholders their concerns that enforcement of marine regulations is underfunded and of the many instances of illegal fishing going on unchecked due to a lack of enforcement capacity. I'm also aware that enforcement officers undertook industrial action earlier this year. And given that there's work being taken forward on inshore fisheries through the Butte House Agreement, can I ask if increasing enforcement capacity is a priority for the Scottish Government and if you expect there to be increased funding in the budget for this coming year? And if not, how will enforcement be improved? There's a lot in there, so hopefully I'm able to address all the points, but I'm sure you'll come back if I don't. But I would say just in relation to the, the workforce and what you're talking about there, we'd had the extra £10 million investment this year, um, recognising just the, the scale of what Marine Scotland uh, has to deliver, whether that's in relation to the Scotland process and the, uh, trying to ensure that we that we have the planning and consenting resources that we need in relation to that, but also in terms of our ambitious environmental agenda too. Now, of course, I, I have to work within the parameters that I have. If I had an unlimited budget, then of course, you know, it would be great to invest more in more vessels for, uh, for enforcement. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And we do have a, a vast sea, a marine area to try and cover with what we do have. So we have our, we have three of the uh, 
uh, the MPVs. We also have two uh, aircraft as well to help us with that enforcement. And I think, um, yeah, as I say, they do have a, a vast area to cover, and we take a risk-based approach in relation to that. I, mean, I would say, if, and just to reiterate and re-emphasise that if anybody is witnessing any activity that they deem to be illegal or, or have concerns, to ensure that they feed that back to us so that we can, again, analyse that and see how we, uh, how we best uh, allocate our resources. Any consideration, is there any consideration to increase the size of vessels, given that we have such a vast uh, am amount of water to cover uh, and, and that there are all these concerns being raised by stakeholders? I, I do recognise the concerns, but I, again, I have to work in within the parameters that I've got. I've talked today about just how the, the significant challenges that we have in the portfolio, and I think particularly in relation to our capital spend. So, and that's what we'd be looking at if we were talking about uh, an enforcement. So, I can't make a promise to the committee today that that's something that we would be looking to enhance at this particular moment in time because of the sheer levels of, of costs that would be involved in that and the significant pressures that there already are on the capital budget. Thanks. Thanks, Convener. Uh, Alistair Allen. I think, to be honest, Convener, my points have been, my points have been raised. OK. Certainly. Jenny Minto. Thank you, Convener. Um, if I understand things correctly, um, the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund um, share for Scotland, um, evidence-based and on sea area, would have been around £62 million per annum. I don't believe we've received this, um, despite Scotland's other government um, promising to match um, European funds on withdrawal. Can you um, tell us how that's impacted on what the work Mar Marine Scotland can do and the flexibility that your department has? Uh, yes, that's right. I mean, we are significantly constrained. Obviously, we could do a lot more if we'd had the, the full allocation that we believe that we are entitled to, but instead we received £14 million, um, which um, the committee will be aware from the regulations that we passed earlier in the year, just about you know what we can fund. We can actually fund a broader range of activities now, which is good, but of course, we still have the same budget, so uh, it significantly constrains our ability to, to do more with the resources that we have. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Jim Fairley. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'd like to turn to the, to the National Test Programme um, and what the £10 million that has committed so far this year has uh, been spent on and whether more detail is available on what the remaining £41 million, and I'm pleased to say that that is guaranteed funding now, um, what the remaining £41 million for the programme is anticipated to spend on over the next two years. Yes, well, the £10 million that has been allocated for this year is for the first track of the National Test Programme that we have started to roll out. So we had the claim window for uh, the claims for carbon audits. It is not possible for me to say exactly right now exactly how much has been spent because it is largely demand-led schemes that we have. We will have the claim window opening soon, I believe, for soil testing as well. So that is largely what the funding this year has been allocated for, um, and that is in relation to the first track. The second track is where we talked about doing more of a, a focused pilot project with, um, with a number of uh, farmers to test what conditionality would look like. The first part of that was about in trying to engage members in a survey, uh, which would be undertaken over the summer as well, and I think that closed towards the, the end of August as the first part of the, the second track. So it's really been about trying to get that rollout and offer the incentives for people to engage in the in the variety of different measures and kind of get that baseline understanding of where their businesses are, are at in relation to their climate performance at the moment. In relation to the rest of the £41 million and how that's been going to be allocated over the course of the next couple of years, Carbon, testing, uh, carbon audits and soil testing are just one element. Uh, when I'd initially made the announcement, and what's come through Ariob as well, is just the importance of uh, animal health and also looking at biodiversity audits as well. We haven't been in a position to roll out biodiversity audits within the first part of the programme just because they're not at a, a stage in their development where they can be rolled out across the country. But that's an element we're looking to add to the programme, as well as we have... Um, 
um, a, a working group in particular looking at measures that can be taken in relation to, to animal health. So these are key areas which will be added to the programme as we progress through the next couple of years. And we also have the livestock performance feedback in relation to that as well. So it's expected that the programme will grow over the course of the next few years. Okay. Um, so that's my understanding. So the £51 million is basically to get agriculture into the kind of shape that it needs to be in order to continue food production, but at the same time meet the demands of climate change that we are, that, that the targets have been set for. Um, are you confident that the programme is going to deliver that for our agricultural production in the future, bearing in mind that agriculture, as we've heard time and time again in this committee, should be about food production? Uh, absolutely. And I think I'd, I'd come back to what we'd set out in our vision for agriculture as well, where we focus on food production. It's about lowering emissions to their lowest possible level and doing what we can to enhance nature. I, you know, I think the, the three of those are intertwined and it is vitally important, I think, given all the challenges that we're looking at now as well. Food security has jumped right up the agenda. That's why we undertook exactly. the work with the ta task force. And that's why we've committed to maintaining direct payments as well, because we know that that food production is so vital. And the £51 million is there ultimately to support the transition and to support people going along that journey. Um, so uh, I know that there are a, a number of, there are so many farmers and crofters already um, who are undertaking the, the types of practices uh, who, that we would want to see. We want to make sure that everybody comes along that journey. And that's where the work of Ariob has been really important in helping shape the incentives that will hopefully um, work for industry as well and with that we're developing that the claims are, are simple they're straightforward for people to take part in and that we are offering the correct incentives so I think that's where the development of that work has been really important but the conditionality is something that is absolutely going to stay so that farmers will be encouraged to grow food given the fact that you're talking about food production food security being much higher on the agenda. Uh, yes, I mean, and we've set out those commitments within, um, it was in our manifesto, it's in our vision for uh, agriculture as well, where we talked about introducing um, the 50% conditionality by 2025, so that's still the commitment that's there. Okay, I've got one last question, Convener. I have concerns about the reports that have been um, uh, coming through The Guardian in the last week, that the UK government is now talking about changing the system in England. The ELMS may be discarded and they go back to an area of payment. If that is the case, will that affect any budget that comes to Scotland in relation to agriculture? Well, that, I'm not able to, to give an answer in relation to the direction that the UK government is doing or where their policy is heading at the moment. And I've still to meet with my, uh, with my UK government counterpart to discuss uh, many of the issues that we've talked about today in more detail. I think we have had concerns about the, our, our future funding, um, particularly I, I know that the committee has taken evidence previously in relation to the Internal Market Act and the impacts that we can see from the subsidy control bill as well. So. Um, yes, uh, we do still have concerns in relation to that, but I can't give a, a categorical answer at this moment in time. So I don't the director wants to come in. Just to add very briefly, maybe to link back to the previous question, an important part of the national test programme is the test element. That's our opportunity to test out with farmers and landowners what are the measures that will help them uh, progress towards lower emissions, uh, uh, a better contribution to biodiversity, rather than you know, go in with both feet establish a new scheme and then discover that there are issues with take-up and barriers that had not been identified uh, in, in the design. And I think we will all be aware that there has been some concerns uh, that the scheme south of the border, that the take-up was, was potentially uh, heading to be low. So I think that's the benefit of the, of the test approach that we're taking, that we can actually try out some of these measures, work out what works well, where we need to tweak things, how we can improve things before we proceed to uh, full-scale implementation. And I would also say that that's where the consultation that we have on the, the Agriculture Bill is really important in relation to that as well, and ensuring that we have that future flexibility, because we know there will be a lot of learning as we go. We need that flexibility and that ability to adapt 
not just for all the learning, the changes in technology and innovation that there could be within that time, but of course recognising I, I mean, all the various crises that we have faced and no doubt there will be more going forward and more challenges. So it's in, ensuring that we have the, the flexibility to, to deal with that and adapt. Can I just ask, does the AREOB still sit after the consultation has finished? I, yes, it's more of a it's an iterative process, so we're going to need uh, AREOB and that, that co-development uh, process uh, as we continue to go forward. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, looking at future agricultural budgets, you know, the process in, in coming to our agriculture bills failed, and, it, and it's failing um, to the point that we've got the NFUS and farmers going to be protesting outside the Parliament in the first week in November, um, and the, the, the President of the NFU suggesting that the, the, the Scottish Government are consulting on the future agriculture policy in an information void and uh, that they are f hugely frustrated that despite several requests it's still unclear on the clarity of how this bill will look going forward to, to deliver um, and a new bill will, which will put food production at the heart of the policy. Again, I would come back to what I'd said previously in response to the, the questions from uh, Jim Fairley in relation to, to food policy because that and, and food production it is a, a key priority. That's why we identified it as one of the, the key pillars of support going forward, why we committed to maintaining direct payments as well. I know that there is that call for, for more clarity and of course we're developing that and working with industry because ultimately we want to deliver a policy that is going to, to work um, for people and in relation to the bill as well, it is really important that, of course, we're consulting on it right now. It's vital that we get the feedback um, before we develop that further, because we want to make sure the proposals that we've set out in relation to a future framework, what we're proposing in relation to you know, modernising agricultural tendencies and a number of measures within there, um, that, we're, that we're taking the correct enabling powers that we need to try and address some of the challenges that we have and uh, looking to have, have some powers there that aren't open to us at the moment in relation to action that we can take. So, of course, that's where I would urge everybody to take part in that consultation, as many people as possible, because it's vital that we get that feedback and we bring forward a bill to Parliament which is going to work and deliver on everything that we need it to. But do you accept that there's an information vacuum and, and the industry that you're talking about consulting with, and we've had the area open, we've had focus groups and whatever, they're coming out and saying there's this vacuum and yet they're asked to participate in a consultation and it's, it's not the right way to do it. Do you accept there's an information vacuum on direction of travel? I, I think that in relation to the, again, to the consultation, it's, it's an enabling... Um an, an enabling bill which brings forward these powers, we have to consult on that because we need to get that feedback in the development. And again, that's where the, the work with Ariob has been really important. I talked about some of the initiatives that we've been taking forward as part of the National Test Programme in shaping and delivering schemes and systems that we, that we know will work based on that um, and trying to deliver either the incentives and the mechanisms to make it as simple and, and as easy as possible for, for farmers to, to take part and get on board. Again, we have tried to get, provide as much clarity as we, as we possibly can at this period in time. We've committed to maintaining direct payments. We've talked about the conditionality and, of course, more detail will, will come on that in due course. Um, but, of course, I, I, you know, I engage with the, with the industry regularly. I, I, I take that feedback, but, again, we come back to that it is really important that we get that feedback on the bill before we bring it forward. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ariane Burgess. Thanks, Convener. Uh, moving on to the Good Food Nation, uh, Good Food Nation Food Commission. So um, the government's uh, estimated that it's going to be about a million pounds to run per year, and we'd be interested in hearing, you know, what are the timescales for establishing it, uh, and any detail that you have on on it coming into existence. <laughs> I will be happy to keep the committee informed on that as plans develop for the Commission. I'm not able to provide too much more information on that today um, because we obviously have time scales that we committed to in relation to the bill as to when a Good Food Nation plan would be brought forward, <coughs> given the, the uh, the nature of the, the Food Commission and as that's been set out in the legislation that's been passed as well, that would, in the development of the plan, will obviously be working to establish the, com the Commission along a, a similar timescale as well. And in relation to the budget that we've projected for that, that's based 
largely on similar sized bodies that we, we have within the government. And um, so we believe those those figures to be representative of what the, the Food Commission, the, the size and what it will be expected to deliver as well. So, like I say, I'm not able to give much more detail on that today, but I'd be happy to, to keep the committee engaged as, the, as this develops further. And just picking up on the plan, so how's the process for that going, the government's good food plan? Again, it's only been a, a few months since the Act has been passed, so we're still in the early stages of developing that. But, I, of course, we'll be looking to produce the, the draft plan in relation to the, the timescales that we have set out in the legislation. Thanks. Uh, can I... Karen, beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think uh, most of my, my questions have been answered there in terms of the, the Food Commission. Um, I, I could try and be a bit, a bit sneaky and try and pull out more information on what it's going to look like, but I, I know that's just that's in the works at the moment. But um, would it be showing any type of monitoring or reporting on the state of food poverty? Again, I think these are things that we'll probably look to develop. I know that when we were having the initial discussions throughout the committee scrutiny of the, of the Good Food Nation Bill and now Act, it, whether it was in relation to, to food poverty in relation mm. to health I think there are a lot of outcomes that we can look to uh, address in some of the, the plans as well as well as and I think it will be within the plans themselves as to how we're going to monitor mm. our delivery against some of the, the outcomes that we set out but I think that of course you know food I know the committee will know given the range of evidence that you heard and what you took as well just how many areas food policy touches and I think that's what's important about the Good Food Nation plans is it's about bringing all that together in a coherent way and ensuring that we deliver on that so how we monitor that is going to be really important but there will be more detail on that within the plans themselves. That's great thank you it's exciting. Looking yeah. forward to it. Just, just on, the, on the topic of food you know there's the, the idea of having a food task force where does that appear in the budget and what's the, the likely cost of creating the food task force? Oh, sorry, do you mean in relation to the, the recommendations of the, with, about the food unit and the food security yes, and supply task absolutely. force and the food security unit? Yeah, I'll, uh, uh, George Burgess yes. can give a bit more information on that. Um, so obviously the food task force has already existed uh, and it produced its report earlier in the summer. There are further meetings uh, of that to be, to be happening. The, the next mm -hmm. one should be happening shortly. In terms of the, the food security unit, and actually it helps pick up a point from Ms Adam uh, earlier, uh, convener, uh, you wrote to the Cabinet Secretary just, I think, last week some of the questions that we didn't have time to uh, get to at, at the last time that we appeared before the committee, uh, the cabinet secretary wrote yesterday, and in that, uh, it, the, the, the letter includes a detailed response on to provide an update on the the, the recommendations from the from from the task force. In terms of where the, the budget for that work will sit, that will sit within uh, my the food and drink division within agriculture and rural economy. We already have. Uh, a number of officials there that have been working on these issues for a long time. We've had the Food Sector Resilience Group and other engagements with stakeholders. We've been working on issues like uh, CO2 uh, shortage for some time. So it, the, the, the unit will be built out from that existing group of staff and the budget will be within, within food and drink, but obviously working across government in the same way as, as food generally, it's a very cross-cutting mm -hmm. issue. Thanks. Just, just on that cross-cutting issue, I'm going to jump back to the islands plan. Um, will, it, will there be a focus uh, in the budget document on how you spend in plans across all portfolios? You know, you've touched on that earlier. Uh, and, and how across portfolios the, the, the budget will help deliver the islands plan? And also, can I just clarify, in the long-term island plan, are you ruling out uh, longer-term funding allocations uh, and if so are you saying that's not possible in the future I know I'm not ruling out future allocations but again I would just come back to that the CSR and the RSR are the broad funding uh, envelopes they're not budgets in and of themselves so of course more detail will be coming forward in relation to that in relation to the the islands plan as well I think the islands plan essentially brings together all the all the other pieces of work that are that are happening uh, across government because obviously islands isn't a, a policy area of its own it's there are so many 
areas and interests across government that impact people on our, our islands, whether that's housing. And I think from the session that I had with the com committee, I can't remember if that was back in June on the National Islands Plan, I hope that, that that comes across. But, you know, that's why we have an islands team. That's uh, why my role in government exists, is to ensure that we are taking into consideration our islands, any potential impact on islands and our rural communities across all policy areas of government. OK, and finally, um, looking back at the evidence session again, some of the local authorities um, suggested that housing and transport were absolutely the main drivers uh, around uh, rural depopulation. So is it possible that the island plan and the associated funding, it's, it's, got too, it's just at the moment too broad, uh, and perhaps particularly given that the cost of living crisis at the moment, would it not be better to focus more specifically on a smaller number of objectives? Um, I, well, I think all of, all of those objectives that we've identified, of course, we need to ensure that they're all still relevant, but I think that a lot of them are. We have a population in that. You touched on housing, on transport. We have fuel poverty as an objective within that. And I think all of these things are vitally important. I attended the Convention of the Highlands and Islands um, uh, earlier, uh, well, just at the start of this week, in Oban, where we were talking about a lot of these <coughs> issues. And again, when, when I'm out on visits and w from that meeting as well, you know, housing is identified as probably one of, if not the only, but it is one of the key issues that people are facing at the moment. I visited Orkney in the summer where I was hearing exactly the same thing, because we don't necessarily see a jobs shortage in uh, rural and island areas, but it's the, it's the housing, the lack of affordable housing for people to stay in our, in our communities. So that's where I think the objectives that we have are still relevant. Um, but it's also not up to the islands programme in and of itself to fund these interventions, because that's where the work that's been taken forward in housing is critically important. We're developing the Remote Rural and Islands Housing Action Plan, um, which is in development at the moment. Um, I'd be happy to follow that up with colleagues if the committee are looking for more information on that, um, because we know that there are particular challenges in our uh, rural and island areas that we need to try and address. So I think the objectives we have are relevant, but it's about these other interventions that we're making across government that are really important here too, rather than just islands programme in particular. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ariane Burgess. Convener, thank you. Um, I was actually just going to um, ask the Cabinet Secretary about how involved she is in the remote rural and island housing action plan. Do you, do you collaborate with the Cabinet Secretary on social justice housing and local government? Uh, yes, and I've had meetings with the Cabinet Secretary to discuss some of the issues, as well as, I mean, there are a lot of stakeholders that I'll engage with, or whether that's, you know, community groups or housing organisations, um, just by the nature of my role. And again, of course, there's so many other, uh, it's relevant to almost all policy areas. So that engagement that I have with my ministerial colleagues is really important. There's also the, the, the Ministerial Task Force on Population, which is, again, about that, that cross-cutting piece. I lead on the um, the rural and islands it, strand of that work has been led by the, the cabinet secretary for the, the constitution. So it's uh, we really, of course, try and ensure that we're delivering on these objectives and, and we are engaging because that's absolutely critical if we are going to uh, deliver and make those changes that we need to see for, for islands communities. Thanks very much. Jenny Mento. Convener, um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That was really helpful to hear about the, the work that goes on um, with the, the, the island boards and, and what have you. And I think well, we've had a lot of um, evidence today and in the previous weeks about the importance of feedback and listening to your communities, but also feeding back to the communities as to how things are going to change. So I'm going to take the, the convener's lead and jump around a wee bit. Um, I'd be, I'd just want to confirm that um, the NFUS is, uh, co-convenes ARIOB, so therefore there is a relationship there within the N NFUS and the actual um, organisation. And also just to quote um, the, the idea of vacuum, I'm interested to know if there's uh, perhaps a vacuum of information uh, and collaboration, if that's the right word to use, coming from Scotland's other unelected government. Um, you're right in relation to the role that the NFUS has and the co-convening role uh, there, but again, Ariob is there to ensure that we have we want to work with industry, we want to work with our farmers and crofters as we develop future policy. 
that is what is critical to me because I want to make sure that we get it right. We are delivering a policy that we are able to implement and will deliver everything that we, that we hope it will in relation to emissions reductions, uh, in relation to ensuring that we have food security and enhancing nature too. Now, that, that does not necessarily mean that, that you know, everybody is an individual within that group. They are going to have different perspectives and, and different views. Um, there are some things we will have to do as a government that not necessarily everybody will be uh, in agreement with whether that is because of the legislative constraints that we uh, exist in or you know, whether that is budgetary constraints too. But that is where it is that co-development piece which is, which is really important in ensuring they are feeding into that process. Thank you. Oh, sorry, George, what do you want to know? Just very briefly on, on the relationship with NFUS and to pick up the convener's comment earlier, I understand that the event in, that is being set up outside the Parliament early next month is intended by the NFUS very much as a celebration of the importance of farming and food production uh, for, for Scotland, something that I think we can, we can all get behind. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Um, thank you. Um, I think it's important that the Scottish Government clearly support, um, you know, after what we've heard in terms of the um, budget cuts to farming, but it is really important that, you know, the news that there's going to be a rally outside Parliament, and I will quote them because they have said it remains hugely frustrating that despite several requests from the NFU Scotland and other stakeholders, we have yet to receive clarity on how any new powers created in the proposed new agricultural bill will put food production at the heart of delivering all the economic, social and environmental benefits that active agricultural businesses will be asked to deliver. And I think that's absolutely damning. It's come to the state where the NFUS have to bring together people because there's been such a lack of clarity. What would you say to that? Uh, first of all, I think to address your first point, this isn't a budget cut to farming. You know, as I'd said earlier, it doesn't impact on any current schemes that we have, and it doesn't impact on what we're delivering in the national test programme. And again, it's ring fence funding that must come back to the portfolio. So I just want to be clear on that point, and also to say that. With, we are restricted in terms of at the moment, in terms of the changes that we can make or what we can deliver in this interim time because of the act that was passed in 2020 and because of the previous commitment that we'd had that we would be delivering stability and simplicity throughout this time, which I think is, has been a really important uh, piece of work. I think to ensure that there has been at least as much stability as we can provide through when you look at all the different crises and upheaval that there's been over the course of the past few years, being able to provide that is really important. Now, I absolutely understand and take the point about people want to know they're planning for the future, they want to know what future policy is going to mean for their business and they want to see the detail of that. The consultation that we brought forward wasn't going to deliver that detail again because it's about the enabling powers that we need for future legislation, but also set out within that as the broad framework of what we're looking at too. We also have the commitments that we've made that we will continue to support uh, uh, food production through direct payments. It's the conditionality bit of that, but we will, of course, it's, it, the co-development that I talked about before is what's really vital and critical here because we want to make sure we get this right. So that's where that work is really important. We want to deliver something that we know will deliver on all our targets um, and that is, is ultimately workable as well. So I, I'm absolutely committed to that work and, of course, we want to provide as much detail um, to people as we can and more detail will be emerging uh, in due course. Thank you. And thank you, Cabinet Secretary and your officials, for joining us this morning. That, that concludes our, our, our question session. So thank you very much uh, for the information you provided this morning. We will now uh, move straight on to Agenda Item 3, uh, which is consideration of the Non-Commercial Movement of Pet Animals Scotland Amendment No. 2, Regulations 2022, SSI 2022-262. I refer members to Paper 3 from page 17 uh, in the paper pack. Uh, do any members have any comments on this instrument? No. Okay, I propose we write to the Scottish Government asking for further information as set out on page 19. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And that concludes our business in public. We'll now move into private session. <laughs>